we had a, a, a beautiful wedding yesterday of Jose and Lydia. It was, oh, it was so beautiful, so beautiful. Just congratulations to both families. And uh, <clears throat> I was, <clears throat> I'm in this, uh, I'm in this, uh, God's doing something in my life right now. How many of you are happy God's doing something in your life? God's doing something in my life where like, <clears throat> my emotions are a little raw in this season. And uh, I cried my way through the whole ceremony. It was, I don't want to say it was embarrassing, but I'm not embarrassed that I love them, but it was embarrassing that I couldn't talk. <laughs> and the more I would think about it, the more choked up I would get. And then uh, Jose was such a, good, such a good guy, he started crying more than me, so that was good. <laughs> so that was helpful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On to some man's business. Did Aaron Gordon get robbed at the free throw, at the dunk contest, or no? Yes, no? All right. All right. I think if you dunk over a seven foot five per foot person, you get the trophy. That's just me. Taco had to move. Okay, good work. Sam will display later on. I've seen, I've, I've, let's not go there at this service. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Great seeing you today in the house of God. So good to see you today serving the Lord. Uh, <clears throat> we are continuing our message series, Yes and Amen, that we started last week. Uh, Travis kicked off for us. Great job, Travis. Thank you so much. <clears throat> My wife and I were away on vacation. We cel celebrate our 20th anniversary in three days, and so we went a little early. Thank you so much, <clears throat> especially those who blessed us in our going away. We appreciate it. Greatly at um, <clears throat> Lydia and Jose's uh, ceremony, I believe um, Lydia's parents have been married 37 years and Jose's 41, I think. So that was so awesome. They, they honored them at their uh, wedding. And um, I pray that you would have the same testimony. Amen. Amen. But not just at 37 and 41, that it will continue. Amen. Not like, you know, we finish, touch down, move on to something else. Just, just keep going. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if you got your Bible, you can turn to... Uh, the book of 2 Corinthians, and uh, I will be there <clears throat> in a moment. <sighs> that was good stuff, Lillian. That was, that was good worship. Amen? Yeah. That was good worship. Um, <clears throat> we don't just sing songs because we think it's fun to do before the service, and uh, not just because we're waiting for people to show up, so we need something to kill time. We actually sing because we know Jesus inhabits the praise of his people. The Bible tells us that God inhabits the praise of His people, and, uh, and He's worthy to be worshipped. It is our duty to worship God. It's part of what <clears throat> not only our assignment is, what we get to joyfully do. We're so fortunate. <clears throat> God has, has assignments for us, and they're all good. They're all good. Amen. And if we get involved in God's plan, our life gets better. And that's a part of what we want to talk about today. In uh, the book of Second. Corinthians, Paul, of course, uh, uh, wrote to the church in Corinth, uh, which he helped uh, found. And uh, his earlier uh, letter, he was letting them know he was coming. And as it turns out, they got a little offended that he didn't come exactly the way he was coming. And while he was gone, there were people who went and promoted themselves in the church of Corinth. And what we, what we see often in, in the body of Christ is there are people who want to come and make complicated things simple in a way that's not truthful. Uh, and, and, and what they do is they give us formulas to things that don't actually have formulas, and they try to make things plain that are really kind of mysterious. And they came into Paul's, uh, where Paul was an elder, and they decided they would promote themselves uh, as having all the answers, and they would promote themselves as, as being uh, in control. And what Paul had to do is he had to kind of put the house in order. What we find as we, as we follow God is we find that um, part of following God is mysterious. Part of finding God is a journey. And the journey is not a one-step process. The journey is a lifelong adventure. For every season, there's a different route. In every phase of life, there's a, another path that God has us on. But we're constantly on this path with him. And that is the promise of God in our life. And what these men were coming into Corinth and doing was they were trying to give them formulas and processes for things that needed the Spirit of God to guide you. And what they told them was, if you need answers, 
just look to me. And Paul said, no, this isn't the way things are supposed to go. What Paul was trying to help them and what the question that we wrestle with today and we cannot get away from in Boca Raton, in Florida, in the United States, and if you're just a citizen of the world today, the question that we're constantly wrestling with is how do we get control in a world that can't be controlled? How do I get a sense of control in a world that seems to be in chaos and un? controllable. The big mystery of the, 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 the religion of Judaism, which first came on the scene when uh, Abraham first began walking with God, the big, the big knock against the Abrahamic religion was, in that day, there were a pantheon of gods. There were so many gods. There was a god of the sun, and there was a god of the moon, and there was a god of the ocean, and it just kind of helped make things a little clearer and a little more simple if you thought everything was controlled by a specific God that you could see. Oh, there's heat. It must be the sun God that's bringing the heat. Because as people, we really want answers and we'd like control. And what happened when Abraham showed up on the scene is God introduced himself to Abraham. And Abraham began telling people, uh, hey, listen, I serve the one true God. And the people are like, one God? How can there be one God? There's millions of God. There's billions of God. There's so many things that are at work in the world. How can there be one God? And they said, here, tell you what, why don't you prove it and show us your one God? And he said, well, there's a little catch to my one God. He's actually invisible. The one true God that we serve is invisible. And this is part of the mystery of following God. God. Part of the mystery is we follow a God you can't see. And we try to make it so simple when really it's a mystery. We try to put answers for things that there aren't answers. We try to bring conclusions to things that are still questions. And we try to bring destinations to things that God just says, hey, it's just a journey. And in this, we shortchange ourselves from the process God's trying to walk us through. And we need to just accept the fact that our God is the one true invisible God who's walking with us on a journey and still invites us into the mystery. The people in Corinth who showed up on the scene said, we have answers to all these questions. And Paul said, they are teachers, but they're false teachers. If they are apostles, they're false apostles. He says, as a matter of fact, these are rebellious people, and I need to write you a letter and help you see that they are not actually helping you. God helped birth this church through me, and I am a spiritual father in your life. Paul was trying to let them know, listen, there's mysteries, and I'm not going to rob you of the mystery for my own ministry. Now, here's what the false teachers generally surround themselves with. False teachers often want to teach you what the rules are and what you're supposed to say no to. Religion wants to tell you what to say no to. If you just avoid that, then you'll be godly. If you just don't do this, then you will please God. If you will just avoid that habit, or stay away from those people, or just don't say those things, or just don't look at that, then you'll be pleasing God to God. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I think many people have the most pure Christianity when they first get saved. When you first meet Jesus Christ, and all of Christianity is just about, I met God. I met the invisible God, and you should too. That's when we have it so pure, because we're just experiencing His love, We experience his presence and everything that we sang about in that last song, which was actually written in this church, this God that breaks chains and sets us free and brings us into his presence and we encounter him. And that, my friends, is the story. That's who God is. But then we met somebody and we said, you should just follow this God. And he does this and they say, well, what about that scripture? What about this teaching? What about this belief? What about what this pastor preaches? What about what that book said? What about all these other things? And it begins to cloud our vision a little bit. We say, wait a minute, I said yes to God. Oh, I also need to, what do I need to say 
no to to please God. And before we know it, we are robbed of the simplicity of our relationship with Jesus Christ for a man-made religion. And this was what Paul was coming to set them straight with and I hope would help some of us today as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, right here in the first chapter, Paul writes this to them. He says, For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, just for those of y'all who you know, kind of forgot, the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, well, us being me and Sylvanius and Timothy, he was not yes and no, but is yes in God. Verse 20, for as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore, also through God is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now, let me help you unpack that just a little bit. This is what Paul is saying right here. Go ahead. He says, because God says yes, we say amen. Because God said yes to life, we just get to say amen. Because God said, I'm going to bring you into a new land, we say amen. Well, what about all that? Well, what God said yes to, I say amen. This is what Paul was trying to teach them. As believers, as Christians, as children of God, we are part of the divine yes. God has given us the divine yes. Religion says no. God says yes. Jesus is not the great one who came to tell us what to say no to. He came to tell us what to say yes to. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Jesus is our yes. Religion is the way to death. It is the earthly no. It wants to give you rules on what to say no so you can feel safe. Because religion doesn't know how to say yes. Religion is terrified that you may get a brain of your own. Religion is fearful that you will actually meet God and start following Him. Jesus is excited, is excited about the Holy Spirit drawing you to Him so He can introduce you to the Father. This is what Christianity is about. <clears throat> the perfect example, and I don't say this, to, I don't put any people down. I have no problem putting false teachings down. The perfect example of this was Buddha. And you may have heard of him. And he's not just a statue that you rub his fat belly. He actually, Buddha came, he was a real person, and he thought long and hard about suffering in the earth. Now, suffering can mean anything. Suffering can mean sickness. It could be disease. It could be poverty. Suffering can be bad relationships. Suffering can just be depression. And Buddha thought, how do we stop this suffering? How, where is the point of suffering and how do we escape it? And Buddha came to the conclusion that suffering and existence are one. They're joined together, he said. And the only way to get out of suffering is to get out of existence. The only way to get out of existence was to get out of desiring anything. So if you cut the root of desire, even for life, even for love, even for health, even to hope to meet God, if you cut out these desires, then we go into this actionless, passionless state of nirvana. Nirvana is not the presence of joy, it's the absence of desire. And once you don't desire anything, then you can't be disappointed you don't have it. That is their answer to suffering. Don't hope for anything and you'll never be upset you don't have it. That, my friends, is religion. Give up on hope so you can give up on 
suffering. Their conclusion to everything is no. No desires, no wants. Jesus says yes. He says yes to life, yes to hope, yes to love, yes to prosperity, yes to friendship, yes to legacy, yes to your future. He says yes. Jesus says, I have made a way for you to the Father. Jesus says yes, enter into the joy of the Lord. He says yes. Now listen to this. Religion teaches what to say no to. We teach who to say yes to. Religion tells you what to avoid. We tell you who to follow. Religion tells you if you go down that road, you're going to burn. We say if you say yes to Jesus, life is going to get better. Amen. This is what our message is. First John, he says this. This is the confidence which we have before God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Does that sound like someone who wants you to say, don't hope? Does that sound like someone who wants to say, just surrender whatever you think may help your life? No, no, no. No, no. This is the confidence we have before God. If we, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And friend, this is what I want to tell you today. This is what prayer is about. Prayer is about saying amen to God's desire for your life. Prayer is about saying yes to God's desire for your life. We find out who God is and what he wants for us, and then we say amen. Prayer doesn't start with no. Prayer starts with amen. Does that make sense? This is where our prayer life begins. And, and so many people just overcomplicate this gospel. They overcomplicate the message of Jesus. They overcomplicate the message of God. And, and I believe most people really have sincere hearts and they have a desire that people would walk with God. They just don't trust Holy Spirit to keep you on the path. And since we can't see Holy Spirit, they decide to become Holy Spirit for you. And they want to help you say what to say no to. They want to help you with your conviction. They want to help you, since you can't hear God, hear them. It's actually the desire of Jesus that you would hear Holy Spirit and just follow God's will for your life so you can say yes to everything God wants to do in your life. Amen? Amen? Amen. This is what we hope happens today and begins to erupt in your life. But it's easy to start on this path and then overcomplicate it. It's not about what to say no to. It's about Jesus. It's about his work on the cross. It's about his death, his resurrection, and his sending of the Spirit. Now, if Jesus didn't perfect it on the cross, if he didn't complete it on the cross, it isn't worth entering into. <laughs> if you can somehow perfect the works of Christ, well, then, unfortunately, we have to nail you to the cross to finish your work. And I'm here to let you know that is not the way of God. The way of God is just hearing his desire and saying yes. It sounds so simple. It sounds so fluffy. But guess what? That's the gospel. He did the work. We enter into the benefits. That's the gospel. He did all the hard work. We do the easy work of saying Yes. And so just like we overcomplicate the gospel, sometimes we overcomplicate prayer because we don't sometimes think that our words are enough. And so we have to kind of spice them up a little bit. You ever seen these spiced up prayers where people have like a prayer voice and they're just talking to you one minute and then, oh God, oh Father God that you will come. Oh, Jesus. I'm like, who? What? Who was that? Like, I thought we were praying. What, what was his voice that I heard? You hear sometimes people preach and they have like a preaching. My daughter accuses me of having a preacher voice. I'm like, no, nah, honey, I got a voice and I'm a preacher. There's a difference. <laughs> nah, baby, I was made for this. <laughs> Y'all preachers know what I'm talking about. 
But it's almost like a different person manifests through them. I'm like, can I get the first person? That's the one we asked to preach. Can I get the first one? That's the one we asked to pray. Well, I don't need a new version of you. I just need the you we asked to actually get up here and lead a meeting. Or sometimes they don't feel like their voice is good enough. Or So if they accept, okay, I can just use my voice. All of a sudden, they think that God has like some sort of ADD. And he might forget who we're talking to at any given moment. So we have to use his name like every two or three seconds. Because he might drift off and hear some other prayer. So we got to keep calling him. Father God, sweet Jesus, hallelujah. If you would, Heavenly Father, over here, Elohim, author of the universe, if you would just come, sweet baby Jesus, and you would, Holy One of Israel, come, my God and my King, my sustainer. He's like, I can almost see him in heaven. Be like, what are we talking about? I don't, I don't understand. What? I forgot what we're even talking about here. I don't even know what prayer to answer at this point. <clears throat> like, we don't, like, he doesn't forget. Like, we can just actually talk to him. Because, like, our words are enough. Amen. And sometimes, like, and here's where we get really bad. We become, like, professional prayers. And we get excited about how good we can pray. And so we want other people to hear us. And so we pray really long and loud. So other people can know how spiritual we are. And when that happens in intercession, we're like, ahem, ahem, start a YouTube channel. Like, we're, we got, we're trying to accomplish something here. Hallelujah. I digress. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, listen, when you're praying, don't use meaningless repetition as the folks who don't know me do. Right? They think that they're going to be heard because they use so many words. It's not like an essay in high school that you keep putting in like, and the very, 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 very tall building was very, 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 very tall. And you're counting the words if it qualifies as an essay. <laughs> like, I think, you know, this sounds kind of basic, but I think sometimes like we get advanced and then we're afraid to go back a step and get simple again with our relationship. So like maybe you're in a season where you're interceding like real good, right? And you had like your prayer list and you're working through your list two, three times a day. And then you work through it maybe once or twice a day. And then eventually you remembered you had a prayer list and you think about it now and then. And then you don't pray for a while. And then you're like, ah, oh, I really should be praying. And you're like, you pull out the prayer list and you're like, I ain't got this kind of time. And you're like, well, God knows. And then you just go on with your life, right? And, and, and sometimes we get so advanced <laughs> We get so advanced and we're like, no, let's just get simple again. Let's just get back to basics. Let's just, let's just pray. Let's just, let's just talk to God. We don't necessarily have to do all this stuff. If that's where you are, if you're in a season and your intercession is rich, man, when those seasons come, go all in. When the grace is on you to intercede for people or when you're just in life and like you remember that your brother or sister or someone said, hey, just can you keep me in prayer on this health issue? And they, it comes to your mind, man, that's Holy Spirit prompting you. Go ahead and just lift up a prayer for them. And, you know, I've been in seasons where I just, there was like just such a rich grace to pray. And you can wake up early and you pray for 40 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour, and the glory of God comes and it's so amazing. And other times, it's just not there. That doesn't mean we shouldn't say anything. It's not a half hour or nothing. It's, it's not an hour where, where Elijah and Moses show up and, and, and the, we build an altar or nothing. It's, it's, that's, that's a deception. That's a false teaching. And that's, we don't want to fall into that trap. Travis talked last week about how we find the promises of God. And we need to find out what those promises are. And we simply need to say yes to them. That's what your prayer life needs to be. What has God said to me? Let me say yes. Let me say, yes. Is your marriage struggling today? Well, the promise of God is that it would be fixed. Let's start saying, amen. If you lack peace in your life, then God is not the author of confusion. You can just say, yes, God. If you're addicted to pornography in this season, you can say, yes, God. You promise to give me a pure mind. If you have a lack of direction in your life today, Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And he invites you to say yes to his way and his truth. If, if you don't know what to say today, Jesus just says, just say yes to me. I, 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 will, I will bring you 
on the path that I have for you. We have a crazy world we live in. And this world didn't come with instructions. We're just out here. It's like when you have a newborn, right? And you're in the hospital and the nurses are just like taking care of the baby. And like one minute the baby's crying and is soiled. And then like they do some stuff and then the baby's changed and not crying. You're like, well, that looked easy enough. And then you go home. <laughs> How come that's not working? <laughs> I don't understand. Or you're in the hospital, they're like, time to go home. You're like, me? <laughs> Send me home. Are you crazy? <laughs> I forget I left the chicken out. And you want to like, make me, have me keep a baby alive? Are you serious? Oh, no, no, no. Four or five more weeks here. We'll be good. Like, I'm, it's, not, <clears throat> it's not quite time to go home yet. <laughs> Can't be time yet. <laughs> Why are you changing the sheets? I, no, 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 no. It's not time yet. <clears throat> There's no instruction manual. And so... We try to get like a grip. We just want some control, some understanding. And, and let me tell you, here's how we get a grip in this crazy world that we live in. We find his promises and we say, amen. amen. That's what we do. That's how you get a grip on this crazy world that feels like it's slipping through our fingers. We trade our plans for his plans. Amen. We trade our life for his life. See, we sometimes, our prayer list becomes our attempt to control this world. At times, it's like, I just got, if I can just get a grip on this world, then things will make a little bit more sense. But prayer is not about control. It's about surrender. Prayer is not about control. It's about surrender. We just find his plans and we say, Amen. We fall in the traps in our modern Christianity because we're so smart these days. We're so bright, so much brighter than those people who wrote the scriptures, apparently. <clears throat> and oftentimes, in our problem following Jesus is we're trying, to, we're trying to attain a better version of ourselves instead of a more accurate reflection of Jesus. Hear me, friend. The best version of you is never good enough. <laughs> the best... The best we could ever be will never be good enough. And so stop trying to tame perfection. Stop. You just got to stop. What we need to be is a reflection of Jesus. We just need to surrender to him and let his life manifest in our life. And friend, when you say yes to God, you're good enough. Amen. Amen. That's how we gain control in this crazy world. The best you could be is not the standard. Jesus is the standard. And he said, listen, just come into my life because your life is it's a hot mess. I've already seen. Come on. Just come on into mine. See, <clears throat> earlier in this first chapter of the second book of Corinthians, Paul starts to really, you can miss it if you, don't, if you don't see it. He starts to unlock a little mystery that sometimes our super smart Christianity misses. See, Paul tells them that, that, that God, God, he... He will be your deliverer. Sometimes you're in rough, rough circumstances. And we just need God. Like, only God can change his circumstance. But he also says, not only is he our deliverer, he's our comforter. And sometimes, deliverance is going to look like just getting through this season. And he promises to comfort us through the season. Just because you're not delivered from the season doesn't mean your prayers didn't work. It doesn't mean that God's not with you. Because he said, I will send you a comforter. This world is crazy. And effective prayer sometimes doesn't change what's around us. It changes what's in us. I, I'm, I'm so comforted by this scripture. In, um, in, in P Peter wrote it. I think it was 1 Peter 5. Is that right? Mike sent it to me. I didn't have it written down. He says, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, watch this, will himself perfect you, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Amen. Amen. This scripture has been life to me in this season where it feels like internally there is like, what is happening in me, God? 
And you just want things to be at peace. And God is like, listen, if you will endure what I'm doing, I will establish you. I will strengthen you. I will confirm you. And I will perfect you. Oh, and so my job is to say, amen, God. I trust that you will carry me through this season. Don't listen to the Instagram lie that there's some perfection that you can get. If you just get the God filter on your life, then all of a sudden things will be perfect. It's it's just not true. It's just not true. When I don't know how to pray... We have two options. One, you pray in tongues, right? If I don't want to pray, I don't know what to pray. Just allow the Spirit to make intercession through you. If you don't have the baptism of the Spirit yet, go for it. It's the promise of God for you. We have two options. You can, you can pray in the Holy Ghost or, watch this, this is not that popular uh, these days because it sounds kind of, let me, let me tell you a story. Let me give you, let me give you a hypothetical. Can I give you a hypothetical? I want you to, Let's use our imaginations. Let's imagine that you're in a discipleship group. If you haven't been in a discipleship group, we're about to launch them once again, come Easter, begin to pray. But if, you, uh, have, have, if you're in a discipleship, think that there's about a dozen people in your group, right? And you have like a really good leader. You ever have like somebody who can like open the scriptures and you're like, wow, it's amazing. You're like, that's guy I want to follow. Or like maybe, I don't know, he walks on water, right? And that's like, you're like, wow, that's... That's pretty good right there. That's a good one, right? Or something like maybe there's thousands of people and he like multiplies bread and fish. Like bread, I can kind of understand multiplying because you just extend the loaf. Fish, as you break it, that part, is, that, that's one harder. Like, is it the midsection? Did they have a couple thousand tails? Like, what was multiplying in the fish, right? Like, these are the things I wonder. Like, he didn't extend the fish. He multiplied them. I don't know. So like, imagine this is your discipler and you want to be like him, right? Like he's a great discipler and you're like, I want to be like him and he does miracles and you don't. And you notice that when he prays, stuff happens and you say to him one day, you get this stroke of genius. This inspiration comes upon you and you say, I know, I'll ask him how to pray. Right? Like, oh, how about that? How about I just ask him, how do we pray? And, you know, there actually was somebody who discipled people like that. His name's Jesus, of course, and you know who I'm talking about. And he had about 12 disciples. He was successful with 11 of them, which is a pretty good, if you've ever, if you've ever been in ministry, that's greater than you've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> you, have, you will never attain that. <laughs> Yeah, you lying. Hallelujah. Amen. And so Jesus tells them, they say, how do you pray? And he's like, here, pray this way. Now imagine this. Imagine you're in the living room and there's 13 of you. One of you does miracles and the rest of you look like idiots at all time, right? And you say, he's calling you the devil. Like, like no, not just you're an idiot. You're like, stupid, What? You brought a sword? What is wrong with you, right? Like, this is, this is how he's talking to you, right? And you say, hey, how do you pray? And he says, pray like this. Now, none of us would say, well, this is probably allegorical. This is probably just a structure of how I'm supposed to pray. I know I'm supposed to go off and then use this pattern of praying. No, no, you would just pray that. You're like, you would, you would literally pray what he said to pray. Well, we have that recorded in Scripture. Believe it or not, there was this exact scenario happened about 2,000 years ago, and they asked him, how do we pray? And he said, pray like this. If you don't know what to pray... You can't go wrong with this prayer. Amen. If you don't know what words to use, you can pray what Jesus said to pray. I mean, it's, you know, when all else fails, do what Jesus said. Sometimes, amen. Sometimes I don't know what to pray. Like, I don't know what to do. You ever be like, I don't have any clue what to do with my life at this moment, right? And I'm like, I just pray this, because I know at least I got that right. You know what I mean? I just feel, it's a win. I prayed the right way. Right? And so if you're not familiar with where this is, of course, they call it the Lord's Prayer. It wasn't his prayer. He told it it was our prayer. It's in Matthew 6, verse 9. And Jesus said, pray this way. Let's all read it together if we could. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's a good prayer. Amen. It's a pretty good prayer. Pretty good prayer. You know, amen. Come on. Now listen, if you're in a season where you can pray way more than that and God has given you like what that means and very, go, do that. But if you're not, just say the words, man. Just say what Jesus had to say. And so I hopefully in the last few moments that I have, I want to kind of jumpstart your prayer life if you need a little jumpstart. And I feel like we all do at times need a little jumpstart in our prayer life. And if you're taking notes, these are three basic areas of prayer that you can pray through. You can write it down. Uh, this, won't, this part won't be on the board. You want to pray God's will through you, God's love through you, and God's plan through you. I'll say it one more time. God's will through you, God's love through you, and God's plan through you. So I want to pray God's will through me, God's love through me, God's plan through me. And I want to help you out and give you three kind of like little examples of these prayers that you could possibly use in your life to kind of jumpstart your prayer life. The first one, if you will put it up, please. I'm going to read this. Lord, I see something in me that keeps me from being totally committed to you. Please talk to me about it and show me the way out. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I've seen something in my life that keeps me from being totally committed to you. Please talk to me about it. Show me the way out. Write that down or take a picture. Or just, it's, it's that simple. Here's what I want to tell you. We're not here alone. We are not here alone. Right? Like we just had Valentine's Day. And when you go out, if those of you who are on a Valentine's date or maybe you don't have a Valentine and so February 14th is a little, you know, a little salty for you, right? Like, and when you fantasize about that day, you're not thinking, I want to go on a Valentine's date and I want to tell the guy how to love me. No, no, you're just hoping that they have all the answers, right? And they know how to love you and you don't have to tell them, like, my wife loves it when I don't, when she doesn't have to tell me, like, hey, I'm busy. If you could pick up, that would be awesome, right? She just wants me to do it to show love, right? And so we can kind of think, like, it's wrong for me to ask God to show me how to love him. That would be absolutely dumb, right? That would be wrong. You could not be more wrong. God is so amazing, he has no problem telling you how to love him. He has no problem teaching you how to love him. He has no issue with that. He's like, man, you want to love me? Let me show you exactly how. And let me tell you, after you're married long enough, it doesn't bother you to do that anymore. You're just like, hey, honey, we're going to go on a date, and here's what I would like to have happen on the date. I'd like to go to this kind of restaurant, and I would like to eat this. I'd like to go about that time. I want you to make the reservation, and then I want you to invite me. <laughs> this is what I want to have. You're like, thank you for telling me how to love you. That's awesome. And then you just do it. And then you have a great date. It's just, that's where your marriage is going. Just so you know, that's what healthy looks like, right? That, that, like, this is what I would like. Oh, oh, I'd love to do that. Thank you. I'm not offended that you didn't, that you don't know what's going on inside of me. I'm not offended <laughs> that you're not a mind reader as well as a husband or wife, right? God has no problem. Watch this. John 16, he says, but when he, the spirit of truth is the Holy Ghost, when he comes, he's going to guide you into all the truth. Do you want to know how to follow God? you want to know how to get out of your current situation that keeps you from loving him perfectly? Ask Holy Spirit to help. Ask Holy Spirit. To, when you talk to God about following him, he sends his spirit to show you the way. Let's put up that prayer one more time, if you would, and let's all pray it together. Go. Lord, see something inside. I'm totally committed to you. Please talk to me about it. Show me. Hallelujah. That's a good word, right? That's a good word. That's number one. Number two, Lord, I don't see the hope I have in you. Please open my eyes so I can see it clearly and serve your purposes. They asked Jesus, what is the greatest of all the commandments? And again, they're thinking religion. What are the rules? And Jesus is like, oh, you want some commandments? I have commandments for you. Love. You're going to love God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbor. I want you to love. 
They're looking for the divine no. Jesus invited them into the divine yes. <laughs> Come on, I just want you to love people. Paul was talking to the church in Ephesus. He's like, man, I really want you guys to grow up. He says, I pray in Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know the hope of your calling. You see, you each have a call on your life. God has called each and every one of us, not just to him. It's not just love the Lord your God, not just keep rules and avoid stuff. No, 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 no. He's called us to one another. He's called us not only to love him, and a lot of people get that right, but he said to love one another. And Paul called this a calling. We have a calling. We're each called to do something. And Jesus modeled this love call to each one of us. He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. He told his disciples, do you want to be great? I see you guys arguing about what the no is. He's like, no, no, no. You want to be great? Serve. Serve one another. Love one another. This is, what he, this is, how, you, this is how you're great. So Jesus is calling you to serve. If you want to be great in the kingdom, this is what we do. Now listen, if you feel somewhat stuck in your relationship or you're no longer a child in God and you're ready to move on to maturity, we are inviting you to be part of the mission of Revival Life Church and serve with a ministry team. Begin serving other people on Sunday mornings. We have two services. You could serve one, attend one. That's exactly why we started two services. And I am... Um, the hope is that we would move from baby Christians to ma mature Christians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul said, man, I wish y'all would grow up, but I have to talk to you like babies. I am amazed, and perhaps uh, I will regret saying this out loud, but I am amazed <clears throat> how many Christians I meet that think they have matured out of serving the local church. <laughs> they, they, they think somehow that they've been doing it so long but they don't have the revelation that I'm supposed to actually be serving. They think that Sunday morning is still about them, and they think they're mature. Like, when you're a child, you need somebody to spoon feed you every week. But when you're mature, you come to someone's house with some food. When I invite young people to my house, they just show up at dinner time. When we invite mature people over, they say, hey, what can I bring and when we become mature in Christ, we show up to the house of God ready to give. <laughs> Not just, I need to be fed again. <laughs> Who's going to serve me today? Who's going to meet my needs today? We said, actually, I'm actually mature. I actually have something to bring today. I'm ready to serve the people. I'm ready to serve the children. I'm ready to serve as an usher. I'm ready to serve as a greeter. I'm ready to serve as a leader of a group. I'm, I'm ready. Christianity, I've recognized, is not all about me, it's about God moving, watch this, through me. Perhaps you've not gotten to where you wanted to in Christ because you still think it's all about you instead of recognizing God has gifted me so that he can flow through me. So let's pray this prayer one time together. Ready? Go. Lord, I don't see the hope I have in you. Please open my eyes so I can see it clearly and serve your purposes. See, Jesus came for a reason. Jesus came for a reason. There were prophecies that the Messiah would come from the Garden of Eden. And all the Old Testament prophets talked about the Messiah who was to come. And there was no debate on when he would come. It said so very clearly in the book of Daniel exactly the age that he would show up. You can look at it right now. Just Google the 70-week prophecy. It's so very clear down to the year where Jesus would come in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew uh, Bible. <clears throat> and so Jesus showed up just like he would promise, and he came as the Messiah. And what he did, the greatest way he served people was he delivered us from the curse of our sin. And that's the beginning of it. That's where it all starts. And so the third prayer we want to pray when we don't know what to pray, <clears throat> Lord, I'm stuck in the mess of my sin. Please come and save me. That's not a one-time prayer. That's not a visitor prayer. That's like a us prayer. Help! Help! I'm stuck in my sin, Jesus. It's like quicksand. And the more you try to fight it on your own, the deeper you get. And we need to say, Jesus, 
help. Does that feel like you this morning by any chance? I mean, I'm, I'm not the only one who's like, ah. watch this, I got a word for you. I got a good, good, good promise for you. Watch this in Romans. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's not a one-time promise. When I got saved, he didn't take that out of my Bible. It's still there. I'm still a whoever. I'm still a whoever. If you're away from God today, if you haven't met Him yet, if you're stuck in sin, this is the prayer for us. Amen? Stand with me if you would. And what we're going to do is we're going to pray this prayer. <clears throat> and if the ministry team comes forward, I just... Uh, I, 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 want us to, I want us to pray. I want us to pray. And, and, and if this is the first time you've prayed this, or if this is the third time you've prayed this today, I want to pray it together. Listen, if, you're, if this is the first time you pray this, you should have gotten a connection card when you came in. And you can check on it right here. Today I prayed to receive Christ. That's you. And you can take it to somebody, whoops, in the lobby, or you can take it to one of our prayer team in the front. Also, if you recognize, I'm ready to grow up and serve in the house of God. You're going to check right there next to I want to volunteer. Just fill out your connection card. You can put it in the drop box back there. You can give it to one of our ushers. You can give it to one of our team members in the back. Leave it on the floor. Believe me, we'll call you. We're just good like that. Because we, we exist to help you begin to serve the Lord. That's why we're here as a church. We want to become disciples, and we want to create disciples. Amen. And so if you are, are, are away from God right now or you're stuck in sin, I mean, you're trapped. Maybe there's habits that you can't get over, but maybe you're just not following God. That's all called sin. Sin is this huge blanket of getting it wrong with God. And so we're going to pray this together. And if it's the first time you prayed it, tell somebody so we can give you some free stuff. Or just come back next week and we'll tell you then. Ready? We're going to say it together. Ready? Go. Lord, I am stuck in a mess. Now, if everybody would close your eyes and bow your head. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for these people and the sound of my voice. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for these people, and I pray that you would answer their prayer today, that you would come and rescue them from the mess of their sin, that you would move them into your purposes and your plan, and you would show your goodness in their life. Now, with nobody looking around, I'm not going to ask you to do anything other than let me know I should be praying for you. So if you would put your hand up and down very quickly, you would say, this prayer is for me, Pastor. I'm stuck. I'm away from God, and I really need Him to break this, the pattern of sin in my life. You just put your hand up and down. I just want to pray with you. I see you over there. Who else? Who else? I see you. In the, yep, I see you there. Yep, yep, yep. Who else? Anybody else want to be included in this prayer? I want to bless you and just pray that you'll be delivered. I'm not going to ask you to do anything other than let me know you want me to pray for you. One more time. Three two, one. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we say, Lord, I'm stuck in the mess of my sin. Would you come and save me? I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, and I thank you, thank you, thank you that he has delivered me from death to life, and I receive him today as my Savior. Father, I pray that you would go with us this week as we seek to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Amen. Can we give it up for the word this morning? That was so good, so good. Listen, if you need prayer today, we have a ministry team who would love to pray with you. If you, if you pray to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time today, or maybe you're just recommitting your life, they would love to pray with you. Maybe you've had a hard week, and you just want someone to pray that your week would be better this week. Maybe you're out of work or you need healing in your body. Just Our ministry team would love to pray with you, so don't leave today without getting prayer, amen? If you're visiting us today, I want to thank you for joining us and spending your Sunday morning worshiping Jesus with us. We're honored and privileged that you would spend your Sunday uh, with us, the Family Revival Life Church. Now listen, guys, we want to be disciples, right? And a big part of being a disciple is making disciples. When you came in this morning, you had two invitation cards on your chair. The easiest way for us to make disciples of our city is to invite someone to church. So right now, I want you to close your eyes, and God is going to give you a face or a name of someone he wants you to invite this week. It might be a coworker, it might be a family, it might be a friend. You got that name? I want you to take this invitation card and you're gonna be brave and you're gonna invite them to church next week and they're gonna come and they're gonna have an opportunity to see 
the goodness of God come into their life to receive Jesus as their savior and to follow him, amen? Can we do that this week, church? Can we be disciples and make disciples? Can we do that? Can we do that? Can we do that? Amen. Let's give it up for Jesus this morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. We love you. God bless you. Have an amazing Sunday. We are praying for you this week, and we'll see you next Sunday.